Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. It's a sort of back home after more than 30 years since I left Procter & Gamble. I think that I'm one of the three oldest people in the room today. <laughs> I'm not going to use slides because the latest in Silicon Valley is to have a more intimate, eye-to-eye, -eye, people to people discussion. And that's what I want to do. Let me tell you what I want to talk about today on, the over, on an overall basis, first of all. I want to talk to you about changing a major global industry. And then I want to talk to you how it's still going to be changing in major ways in the future. I started my career at Procter & Gamble in what we used to call big soap. Any of you remember that term? <laughs> and, hey, good. And I worked on the smallest brand. I worked on bonus. Does anybody in this room remember bonus detergent? Good. I'm glad there are a couple of you that do. I did wind up with some bigger ones, like Cheer, uh, Ivory Liquid, and so forth. And I would have stayed at Procter & Gamble forever if it weren't for the fact that in the late 1970s, a friend of mine who was in sales at Procter & Gamble wound up inheriting his wife's family business, selling eyeglasses in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He was death on going there and taking over the business, but there was nobody in the family to do it. And family pressures being what they have always been, quit Procter & Gamble and went down there. And a number of months later, I was on business in Louisiana. And I thought, well, I'll stop in and see him, right? All I could hear was, what a stupid decision he'd made. <laughs> this is just an awful business, working with optometrists is no fun. And now, the US Supreme Court, he said, has passed a law saying optometrists can advertise. Now what am I gonna do? Advertising had been legal in only two states up to that point. And he said, in Texas State, Optical's gonna come into Louisiana and kill me. So she got to do your own advertising. I don't know anything about that. I was a sales guy. I had the Oklahoma, Texas district. So I said, well, I'll help you on the side. And did some TV advertising. And in the face of Texas State Optical coming into Louisiana, his business went up fivefold. And I thought, oh, wow, that's interesting. And I had said to him, how do you make eyeglasses? Answer, I don't know. The wholesaler does it. So I was down there one day, and he says, these are nice guys that do the glasses. He says, you want to know how they make them? He says, why don't you come with me, and they'll show you around. I walked out of there, having learned that it takes between 12 and 20 minutes to make a pair of glasses and how easy it is, the basic machine tool process. And I said, why don't you put the machines in the store? That would really be the way to go. Can't afford to do that. Anyway, a couple of years later, Remember how we were talking about putting the machines in the store? He says to me, and I said, okay. Is that better? I, I'm even louder. <laughs> so we put the machines in the store in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And this is in the days when you sold maybe four, five pair of glasses a day. The first day with the machines in the store, we did 21. I thought, unbelievable. When I saw how well that worked, I thought, you know what? I love Procter & Gamble. I love what I'm doing. I was in the coffee division by that time, and I resigned. And I said, I'm going to build one of those in Cincinnati. <laughs> so we did, and he, we had a deal, and he got two states. He got Texas and Louisiana, and I got the other 48. He was a sales guy, and all of you who've worked with sales guys know that they hate to not be able to drive to everything the same day, <laughs> right? <laughs> so we opened this store in Cincinnati, and it was unbelievable. Within a few weeks, we had a Saturday where we did 100 pair of glasses. Nobody ever heard of anything like that. And by the way, I want to back up. When I resigned, Al Harris, does some of you remember Al Harris, who was executive vice president at the time? Al called me to his office on the 11th floor. And I crept into his office, and he read me the riot act about how could 
I have been so ridiculous. Got home that night, seven or eight o'clock at night, phone rings. It's Al Harris. Dean, are you looking for investors? <laughs> Al Harris was my first outside investor. Anyway, it worked, but let me tell you what worked, because this is what is going to apply for all of you in anything you do, especially if you're involved in marketing or selling to anyone. You know what I learned at Procter & Gamble? And I learned it primarily from Norm Levy and Gibby Carey. Some of you remember those two guys? They used to give seminars on advertising that works. And as brand managers, nobody wanted to go because they were too busy. I went to all of them twice because they really, really had something. They understood the principles. And the way I've boiled it down from many, many seminars is this. At Procter & Gamble, I learned how to successfully market products in which there is little or no inherent interest. Who's interested in Laundry detergents, toilet tissue, toothpaste, it's, it's, it's not a high interest category. And guess what? That's what eyeglasses are. And then I learned that if you're going to successfully market products of this sort, there are three terms you need to know. Just three. One is you need to say something provocative. And if you can remember that word, it'll stand you in good stead. Say something provocative. What you say that's provocative, however, has to have substance. It can't be like I'm selling trips to Mars. There's no substance, there's no relevance, right? It has to be meaningful to the target consumer. And the last thing is it has to be credible. Another way to say credible, you have to give people permission to believe. I have never been good at writing copy, never. I tried to write it, but it wound up being what Norm Levy and Gibby Carey called telling, not selling. <laughs> I called up Julius Harburger, who was a Compton top creative guy at the time. I said, Julie, can you help me? He says, oh, that's easy. That's easy. He says, and he did it just like this. He says, why don't you say something like, did you just wait and wait for your last pair of glasses? Never again. Now you can have glasses in about an hour. I said, that's it. And I've been using it for 30 years around the world. And I got it for free. <laughs> but what we did was we promised something provocative, glasses in about an hour. Everybody thought there was some German engineer or artisan in the back room for two weeks making your glasses, right? That's what the optical industry wanted you to think. Glasses in about an hour. Now that I had to make it credible. So what we did is we said, listen to our customers. And we use testimonials. I've always loved testimonials in, in advertising. They do work. Listen to what our customers say. And just little things like, yeah, they really did. I went and I had a cup of coffee and came back and my glasses were ready. And then we did two other things. At the end of each commercial, we did, and still, when we're talking glasses an hour, did the same thing. We said, come watch us make your glasses in about an hour. And that was sort of really permission to believe, right? If they can do that. And you know, and you know what we put in the window of the stores in those days? Some of you will remember the early lens crafter stores. We put the lab in the window. Everybody knows what glasses look like. And you don't know what they look like until you put them on your face anyway. So we put the lab in the window. I used to go out in front of the early stores because always, always be people out there watching because all the lab people were wearing white jackets. And customers would be saying things like, wow, look at all those doctors in there. <laughs> they were kids that had just graduated from high school. <laughs> I could teach any one of you to make even the most complicated glasses Probably two hours, certainly no more than two days of practice, you can make anything. It's, it's, it's just not that difficult. So we opened some stores in Cincinnati, and then we thought, oh, you know what, this works. Let's open some more. So we thought, well, we'll go to Chicago. And people said, oh, 
might work in Cincinnati, will never work in Chicago. Chicago so sophisticated. We did get that back in those days. We went to Chicago, and we did fabulously well. And we just kept expanding. Eventually, I sold the business to the United States Shoe Corporation because it was costing $800,000 in those days to open one store with all the equipment and the inventory and everything. And I ran a form for five years on an earnout basis, which worked pretty nicely for me. After that, I had a non-compete in North America. So I thought, I'll retire. About two weeks later, I unretired. <laughs> I couldn't stand not going out and doing something. And a guy used to keep phoning me who sold shoe manufacturing equipment to the U.S. Shoe Corporation to whom I'd sold. This guy from England was the international sales director for the Standard Machinery Company. They're the world's largest manufacturer of shoe sewing machines. <laughs> Somebody has to do it. So he kept saying, why don't you bring this to England? And I thought, well, England's too traditional and all that. But I thought, well, I don't mind getting on a plane going to England. So he showed me around. We went to one of the very few malls in England in those days. And I thought, you know, it might work here. He says, I've been with Standard Machinery for 23 years, and if you'll do this, I will serve as your local manager. He says, I'll quit my job because I know this is going to work, and he did. So it made it easy for me. And we've always used local people in every nation. As of now, up to now, I've had 2,200 optical stores in 29 countries. And that doesn't include 600 and some in India, where I've been an advisor and uh, lots of other sorts of things. But what I, what I would say is two things now that are part and parcel of what I've learned. If you have an idea, try it. Don't examine your navel all day long and do research and <laughs> just do it. And fortunately, when I was at Procter & Gamble, I reported up through Tom Laco. Do some of you remember Tom? Tom was an advocate for the ideas his people had. He supported them. And Tom would have said, try it. Try Chicago. Try this, try that. You know what I even tried? I got a phone call one day from a guy who said, you ought to go to the Soviet Union. Yeah. I said, no. <laughs> I was in Finland one day at an international shopping center convention. He phones me and says, your secretary said you're in Helsinki. He says, I've already got you a visa. Go to the train station. Come into St. Petersburg. All my other optical businesses had been optical ventures. This was my first optical adventure. <laughs> but it paid off hugely, because that's where I met my lovely wife who's here today. <laughs> <laughs> So, try it. Try things. It's not a big deal if it doesn't work. You just kind of hide it and just <laughs> go, go, go do something else. The other thing is, let me say something about market research. Market research has always driven me nuts. It can be very, very useful and it can be very, very dangerous. When we were raising money for our various businesses, we constantly have investors saying, we're going to do some research. <laughs> okay. They come back and they say, one hour service is number seven out of ten major things that people want in eyeglasses. What's number one is the accuracy of the prescription, and then the accuracy with which the lenses are made, and then the selection of frames, and how all this sort of stuff. That's way over one hour service. By the way, if you look at Procter & Gamble products, a huge number have been marketed on the basis of something other than the main function of the product. Ivory liquid keeps hands young looking, at least that's the way it was done in my days, and so forth. You don't need to sell a product, to market a product on the basis of its main function. Find something unique, something that will differentiate yourself from all the others that do otherwise the same sort of thing. Let me move on quickly to some of the things that are happening in the optical industry. Uh, I'm proud to say that one of the changes we've made in the optical industry 
is bringing women into the optometry world. When I started, 98% of optometrists were men. They worked, worked Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and half a day on Saturday. <laughs> you, you, it was very difficult when you're in a mall. If you can't give an eye exam and you're open 74 hours a week, it's very, very difficult. So we started hiring women who would prefer to work in the evenings. When their husband was home and the kids were taken care of by the husband and so forth, we started hiring women and people thought we were crazy. Today, in the United States, this year, 72% of optometry graduates are women. And it's a, hu it's a huge career opportunity because you're a doctor, it's a sophisticated career, and you can be in it and out of it and part-time and all that sort of thing. And that, that's been a huge change. And I, I guess I got to say, I didn't do it because I was so pro-equality as I was pro-getting the business to work. <laughs> and we got it to work. I'll tell you another thing uh, that's going to happen now. I'm going to talk about four things coming down the road. I'm on the board of directors of a company based in California, uh, just outside of Newport Beach, that's making a product called NeuroLenses. I doubt that any of you have ever heard of them yet, because we only have 170 locations now that sell them. NeuroLenses are curing 54% of migraine headaches. And by the way, if they don't cure it, they don't help at all. <laughs> so, you know, this, this sort of situation, well, they do for some people. But they're also, with, we don't have clinical data, but we know anecdotally that we're curing so-called dyslexia in a lot of children. What, they, what we have done is design an instrument that follows your eyes. And when you look at things close, your eyes turn in. Everybody knows that, right? You know, they converge. 70% of people's eyes converge to a point that's not comfortable. A third of that 70% actually has either pain or after a couple hours blurry vision or something of that sort. A lot of people call it computer vision syndrome. What we have done is make an instrument that measures to where your eyes need to converge at various distances and where they wish they were. The where they wish they were is hard to do. And I won't waste time here to explain how, but it, it, it works. Then we put prism in the lenses, usually zero for distance, with more and more prism to move your eyes to where your brain wants them to be. And it works. I interviewed a, a, a patient in Orange County that had my lovely Russian wife, who, by the way, is an ophthalmic microsurgeon, had her with me. This woman says, I've, I've had migraine headaches for 18 years. Spend half my life in dark rooms, can't hold a job. And she said, I've tried everything. And somebody told me about this, and I thought I'd try it. She says, I came in here, and they said, your glasses are ready. We're busy. Here they are. Sit here, try them, see what you think. She had a splitting headache when I came in. So I put the new glasses on, and the headache went away instantly. She didn't know who I was. She thought I was a guy with a camera, right? I said, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The headache went away instantly. She says, yes. And by the way, we see a lot of that now. When we left there that evening, my wife says to me, what are you going to do with that, that video? I said, we're going to use it in training and marketing. She says, you can't use that. Nobody will ever believe it. <laughs> but it does. It works. And it's a, it's a big deal. You know what the problem is? The lenses are expensive because they're all individually made. There's only one company in the whole world that can make them, and they're in a place called Okasaki in Japan. But you're going to hear more about neural lenses. Uh, over the years. Another thing is remote refractions. One of the challenges we have in the optical industry is that optometrists are the gatekeepers. If you don't have a prescription, you can't get glasses, right? They insist in all 50 states in the United States and in the United Kingdom and uh, I guess Australia, South Africa, and Canada. You cannot get a prescription without getting a, what they call a comprehensive eye exam, and you got to pay $140 or whatever it is. The chances of you needing one are actually 
not all that great unless you uh, unless it's been more than three years but you got to do that because those are the regulations if you could get your prescription and it was dead accurate and you didn't have to go through all that what would that do we're going to find out because there is now an app that is almost ready for the market not quite until we get some ambient light balance challenges figured out you download the app you shine the thing at your face you look into the camera and it tells you your prescription and and, and that's it oh but the states are all saying oh that's illegal you have to have the doctor in person all this sort of stuff well we're going to get around that we're going to we're going to separate a prescription from the comprehensive eye exam that's not going to be terribly difficult okay uh, just two real quick things I know I'm out of time one is I'm on the board of directors of a business in the United Kingdom where all the equipment all of it that is used for an eye exam fits in a briefcase it's all been miniaturized and that's not a surprise these days is it Guess what, though? The optometrists don't want it. They won't touch it. They won't buy it. If you go into an optometrist's practice, the thing sitting on the table that you look in for the autorefraction and all that, if you take the cover off of it, there's almost nothing in it. <laughs> this is true. It's mostly air, but <laughs> it's the impression, right? Now you can miniaturize the stuff. And one last thing, there's a model change in optical retailing that I'm involved with. It started in Germany, a company called SuperVista AG. I'm on their board of directors. Just went into the U.S. market, been all, we're all over Europe, including Spain. It's social media marketing to recruit patients and then send them to traditional private practitioners and there's a revenue sharing model. And it is, it's only a couple of years old, and we're already doing over 150 million euros a year with a 10% EBITDA for a startup, which isn't bad. You're, you're gonna see this model now catering to the traditional private practitioners that remain. In the United States, within a couple of years, we're gonna be down to only 25% from the 7% when I started. Anyway, that's it. 